I'd like to welcome everybody to our lecture tonight. Now you're probably wondering why am I standing here with a mic and there is no speaker in the room. And that's because uh, when we promoted this event tonight, we had a number of people who were very interested in the topic but lived in Prince Edward Island or from far away and were unable to come tonight. So what we decided to do was videotape it and we will post it on our website. So if you know anybody else that would like to hear a bit more about dry eye and couldn't make it tonight, then there's an opportunity to do that. But I do want to make sure that every, we, I'm amazed at the turnout. Thank you so much for all coming, especially in our lovely spring weather tonight. Um, I didn't even put any boots on. <laughs> Hopefully I'm not wading out in snow when we're finished. Um, but uh, could everybody in the back hear me? Am I talking loud enough? We're, we're good? All right. So uh, my name is Toby Mandelman. I'm an optometrist at uh, Bedford Eye Care, which is an uh, optometry clinic in uh, Bedford, Nova Scotia on uh, Duke Street. I practice with uh, three other partners and we have two associates as well. So we're six optometrists in our office and about 24 staff, Cindy, would you say? Yeah, Cindy's our manager in our office. Yay. And tonight we're going to talk all about dry eyes. So it'll be about 45 minute talk. At the end, you'll all be experts on dry eyes. And it is a very interesting topic. Uh, very um, trendy topic today, I would say, and a lot of uh, misunderstanding as well. And why is it not advancing? All right, let me just check that here. All right, computer just decided to be a little cantankerous. Now it's working. All right. So what you'll learn today is about a condition that affects uh, nearly 90% of patients who've been diagnosed with dry eye. It's actually 86%. And you're going to also learn about some tiny glands in our eyelids that do have a very big impact on our tear structure and keeping it healthy. We're also going to talk about something called meibomian gland dysfunction which is sometimes called MGD for short. And this is actually the leading cause of dryness and that we've been seeing in our office as well. And also about a new treatment that is available in the Maritimes called Lipiflow that can actually restore the function of the glands in the lid. And we currently are the only office in the Maritimes with a Lipiflow instrument. It's very exciting. Uh, when I first looked into Lipiflow, came out about four or five years ago and uh, the rep on the phone was telling me how much it was and after my jaw dropped onto the floor, I think it was the first time I'd actually had complete silence on the phone because I could not believe how much this thing cost. So we didn't get it at the time but the price has been dropping and dropping and finally it came down to a much more reasonable level and about a third of the price for our patients now. So we're a lot happier about that and so we ended up getting it. So one of the things that you need to understand is what is a tear film and why it can become uh, unstable and why it's very essential for eye health and comfort. <coughs> All right, so here's our tear film. I'll use the little pointer here. Can you guys see that? No? So if I can walk around, just see if I can change that to there. All right called laser pointer on here. <laughs> so the very bottom layer you can see there is the mucin layer and mucin is just kind of like a sticky substance that lets the tears adhere to the cornea. That's usually not where the issue is. The next layer you can see up here in the middle and that's really thick is called the aqueous and the aqueous is like the watery layer of your tears. So if you're crying and you see all those tears running down your face, that's aqueous that's coming out. The very top layer, which is a layer a lot of people don't know about, is the lipid layer or the oily layer of the tears. And this is a really essential layer. It keeps the tears from evaporating from the surface of the eye. So if we go back to our science class, let me just get rid of the laser pointer. Um, when you see here, you take a glass of water, you pour some oil into the water, the oil will automatically rise to the top. So if I took two glasses of water and I poured a bit of oil in one glass and I left them both out overnight, I got up the next morning, let's say 24 hours later, one of the glasses could be almost empty 
from evaporation, but the one that has the oil on top will still have all the water present. So you can see pretty dramatically how important oil is in our tears. All right, so let's take a closer look at tear film structure. I'm going to go to the next slide here. All right, so we already talked about how you have, where the arrow is, a protective water layer. So we talked about the tears, right? And the aqueous is what is nourishing our cornea. So we have two glands that are kind of up here by your temples called lacrimal glands. And it's the lacrimal glands that produce that watery layer, hopefully in abundance. Then you can see the arrow pointing here now to the oil layer, which is produced by a bunch of glands called meibomian glands. And in this picture, you can see right there at the bottom, and I'll have a better picture of this, just the very tip of the meibomian gland and the little orifice to let the oil out. Okay? Next slide. All right. So if you don't produce enough of the oil or the lipid layer of your tears, what happens is your tears begin to evaporate very quickly. And this can lead to red eyes, dry or gritty feeling in the eye, irritation, burning, even blurry vision and eye fatigue because the tears are the first layer that light is entering when it comes into the eye to give you the nice picture that you're seeing. And if that tear layer is unstable, it's evaporating, it's like having a really dirty windshield and you just can't see clearly. When you blink, you might be able to clear it. It's like getting the wipers to go by, and then it kind of gets all blurry again because, again, the tears are evaporating. I kind of like to call it almost like you're getting chapped eyes. So we all know about chapped lips, and when you get chapped lips, your lips are dry, and you're somewhat inclined to lick your lips because they feel very dry and uncomfortable. When you're licking your lips, all you're putting on your lips is water. Same thing, you could splash water on your lips. But what happens is it just evaporates very quickly and your lips just get drier and drier and drier. So this is the same thing as the eye. So on the lips, you just put a little bit of chapstick on your lips and that holds the water layer or the moisture on your lips. We're trying to do the same thing eventually with the eye. So, pointer. All right, so if your meibomian glands don't produce sufficient oil, then this water evaporation causes something called MGD, or meibomian gland dysfunction. And just as we talked about, with all those symptoms, the redness, the dryness, irritation, burning, and eye fatigue, lead to a syndrome called dry eye disease. Back on. That's okay. Back on the seat. We're all looking at you. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. And you know, it, it's been an interesting... Um, journey for me with dry eye, and you see today we call it DED, dry eye disease. Years ago, we used to just call it dry eye, and years before that, we just didn't talk about it. So, you know, when I started practice over 30 years ago, if I had a patient mention their eyes were dry, I would usually just change the subject because there was nothing we could do back then. And even a few years ago, if people mentioned they had dry eyes, we usually just handed them a sample of some type of a lubricating drop. In fact, you might have had a doctor do this, hand you a few samples of lubricating drops and just say, here, try these and we'll see what works. So today we're a lot more scientific about this and it's very exciting actually to be able to actually pinpoint the reason for dry eyes and we're treating it like a disease today, like glaucoma. We don't wait till a patient goes blind from glaucoma before we start treating them. We catch it early and we treat aggressively and today none of my patients go blind from glaucoma. So same thing with dry eyes. It's a disease. We want to treat it early, get at it before there's a lot of damage and the patient ends up more uncomfortable than ever. So surprisingly, <laughs> nine out of ten patients who have dry eye disease have MGD or meibomian gland dysfunction. Now, in my experience, having seen a number of patients over the last year and a half, we've been running the dry eye clinic, um, they have a, a lot of other problems too, but, and we have to treat all of them. So just treating meibomian gland disorder is not like a magic bullet. We usually have to treat other issues as well, 
but surprisingly, about 86%, when they have a dry eye issue, they have some issue with their meibomian glands. So often MGD is uh, the right diagnosis for many cases of dry eye. So let's look at the meibomian glands. Let's get a better picture. So here they are. I'll give you that little pointer. So you can see them running up and down on the eyelids here. And there's about, depends on the person, maybe 30 to 50 of these glands on the upper lid and lower lid. And you can see them running like little stripes along the lid. They're on the inside of the lids. Every time the, the lids come together in a blink, the um, meibomian gland squirts a little bit of oil out. And that's how the oil gets into the tears. And so here we can see on this picture here, when you blink, a little bit of oil will pop out of each one of those glands, enter the tears, and protect the uh, tears from evaporating. So what is meibomian gland dysfunction? This is what it looks like. If you see here, this is what was once that little stripe that we were looking at. So if the meibomian glands start to become a little bit blocked, so the oil no longer squirts out when the tears, when the lids come together. And if that happens, the gland starts to get blocked. So it, you can see it enlarging. In fact, at times when it's blocked up, it's going to try to produce more oil. And so it thickens and gets bigger. And then eventually the gland shortens and then eventually it disappears and you lose the gland altogether. Go to the next slide here. So MGD, basically, we don't have enough oil in our tears, causes a very rapid evaporation of the watery layer, and this leads to inflammation and irritation. And inflammation is huge today. We've all heard about heart disease, so many different um, diseases in the body. Inflammation plays a role in it, and it plays a huge role in the eye. So if we start getting the meibomian glands getting blocked and you're not having enough oil in the tears and the tears are evaporating, then it starts something called an inflammatory cascade in the, in the eye and we get inflammatory cells showing up and they can start attacking the eye itself. And you end up with this vicious cycle of your eyes just feeling miserable all the time and getting worse and worse. And the inflammation absolutely has to be addressed. This disease is progressive and chronic. So it's not, you don't get MGD and we treat it with a magic wand and voila, you are better. This disease is like arthritis, all right? I have arthritis. I will always have arthritis. It's genetic for me. It's, I have inflammation all the time. But with proper management, I'm kept under control and I can live a pretty normal life. But at times I go through flare-ups. The same thing with dry eyes. We can treat it, we can manage it, we can help people feel more comfortable. You'll go through cycles where all of a sudden you have a flare-up or an exacerbation. That can be treated as well. But you never get rid of it. You have to kind of face facts that you have a disease. Luckily today we can keep it under control much, uh, much better than we used to be able to. But if we don't treat it, the glands eventually will disappear. And over the last, as I said, year and a half, uh, especially the last year, we have an instrument now that images the meibomian glands. And it's shocking how many glands it we see that have just vanished in people's eyes, sometimes altogether. Very, very hard to treat if you don't have any glands left. So here's what they look like. On the left, that's a normal eye. So that's lovely. All the young people have eyes that look like that. You can see the average age in our group is a little bit older. Um, and on this side here, so you can see there's a whole bunch of them. They run from the top of the lid down to the bottom. Again, they're on, when we pull the lid down, they're just on the inside of the lid. On the right is what I've been seeing a whole lot of. So you can see here we have glands that are shortening and glands that are dropping out altogether. And this can really progress to the point that I've seen people with these teeny little stubs of glands left, really bad. And the problem is that when does a patient become symptomatic? You become symptomatic, you only need five glands functioning for you to feel okay. So under five glands, a patient will start to be symptomatic and it can be two different things happening. We could have a patient who only has four glands left in the whole eye 
those are difficult to treat. Or we can have a patient where almost all the glands are blocked, but they still have glands. They're just not functioning. That's the type of patient that responds really well to treatment. And what's the best treatment, we'll be talking about some other treatments, but if we're talking about MGD or the blockage of these oil-producing glands, the best treatment on the market today is lipoflow, thermal pulsation. And we're going to talk a lot more detail about it. So some people will ask us, you know, lipoflow heats up the lids, melts the, the blocked oil in the glands. Why can't I just use a warm compress? Because my doctor has prescribed warm compresses for me. You know, and sometimes I put them on and, yeah, I feel a little better. But why isn't it a, a, a real help for dry eye? There's a few reasons. One is they don't get that hot, so you'd have to keep dipping them in hot water to keep maintain heat on the eye. And the other problem is we would have to get it really hot in order to try to melt the plug glands because, remember, they're on the inside of the eyelid. So if we're applying heat on the outside, it won't penetrate far enough into the lid. The other issue is that... And there's been some research showing that if we put on a super hot compress on somebody's eyes and we want it to really penetrate, so people used to tie these things on and get them pressing really hard against the eye, we could actually physically deform your eye <laughs> permanently, right? So we're very reluctant now to use aggressive hot compresses on the eye. And also, all you get out is the little bit of oil that's kind of at the end of the gland. It will, sque will squeeze out and you feel a little better, but it doesn't evacuate or empty the gland, and we're going to talk about why that's important here. So why is lipoflow different? So I'm going to bend over again and point here with my pointer. <coughs> As you can see here, there's, a, there's an activator, this little dome thing right here. This is your eye cut in half, and there's the cornea. So the activator from the lipoflow instrument vaults over the cornea, so it doesn't touch it. So when it's applying heat, none of it touches your cornea. So when it's applying heat, you can see that it turns red here, and it's heating up the inside of the lid where the meibomian glands are. So we have meibomian glands that are all blocked with all the solidified oil, and when we apply heat, the oil turns back to oil again, basically. It goes back into liquid form. And then the instrument applies pressure, right, where those blue arrows are. And it's like a gentle massaging motion, and it's, it's kind of like a little milking machine. <laughs> and it evacuates the glands. It gets all the oil out of the glands. So it's called, fancy name, Vector Thermal Pulse Technology. And you can see a woman here with the activators on her eye right there. And there's little, you can see where the excess oil is draining out and how it's all connected here. And what we're trying to do is apply heat, as I said, to the inner side of the eyelid. And when we do that, that's another close-up there, we unblock the gland and clear it. So all of that blocked stuff could have been in there for decades comes out, right? I should talk a little bit too. Some people kind of wonder, how did I get like that in the first place? Like, why, do my, why are my glands all plugged up? And there's a few reasons for that. Um, one is age. We're kind of outliving the function of the many of our organs in our body, and these little meibomian glands probably weren't meant to go into our 50s, 60s, and 70s and function normally. So part of it is age. Hormones play a role as well. Dry eye is almost epidemic amongst postmenopausal women, at least to some degree, so we know that hormones play a role, and believe it or not, it's testosterone loss that starts to affect the glands, and they start to plug up. Medications play a role as well. Um, people that are on high blood pressure medications, you have allergies and you're taking an antihistamine, that dries you out, and medications for depression can dry out the eyes. Uh, younger people that may be taking medications for acne, that is very destructive to the meibomian glands because those drugs prevent oil glands from functioning. So uh, environmental exposure to smoke, uh, modern pollutants can do it. And you know one of the biggest things that is, uh, and why we're seeing so much more of it today, 
is the use of computers and cell phones. And so we're starting to see dry eye in young people. It's really surprising. And you know why? Because we've all forgetting how to blink. We've become starers. That we just look at our screens, because every time you blink properly, the lights all go out. And so we don't want to miss anything. There's lots of action today on computers. You know, young people have a, you know, they can, f they can, you can keep their attention for about, what, two minutes, and then it moves on to something else. So they've just started to stare at screens. And remember we talked about when you blink, that causes this little squirt of oil to come out of the glands. So if you stop blinking, and people think, I blink, but you know, when we measure it, you don't. And the lids have to completely come together, not halfway down and back up. They've got to come together and touch each other. So if we have a lot of young people doing these little partial blinks constantly, then the oil never comes out, and it just gets backed up and plugged inside the gland until it damages the gland. So this instrument restores gland function. It's really cool. So the treatment itself, from the you know turning the switch on to turning it off, is about 12 minutes. You do both eyes at once although you're in the treatment room for about a half an hour. It's very safe and effective, and 90% of patients who've been treated, there was a big FDA study on this, and <coughs> it's all FDA approved, showed, 90% uh, of them showed an improvement in the, these secretions, especially from the oil glands in the eye. Very, very, very effective. So before I go on to the other factors, I, I know that's kind of small for you guys back there, so I'll describe them. Um, let's actually go back to here. The, okay, I'm just ha having a senior's moment here <laughs> about what I was just about to discuss. Hmm. I'll go on, it'll come back to me, okay. All right, so let's talk about other factors in dry eye disease. So I didn't want to leave you with the impression that everything is caused from one thing, the meibomian glands, because there's a huge number of factors that can affect people in dry eye. For instance, when we do a dry eye assessment, it takes us an hour to complete one. So you have a lot of testing done by some very fancy instruments, and then the doctor sees you and does some more testing and then discusses therapeutic approaches. And every patient is different. There's very few patients that have all the same problems because there's so many different things that can go wrong. <coughs> so when we do an assessment, we look at a number of things, the first of which is aqueous production. So we're looking at how much water do you produce in your tears? Because we do have patients that don't have enough water. Maybe they have oil issues, and some of them have a double whammy. They don't even produce enough water in their tears, which is treatable. We also have to look at whether there are inflammatory chemicals in the tears, and we have special instruments that can measure that. Because if you have a high level of in inflammatory molecules in the tears, we have to address those. We have to bring those down. Or you're, even if we treat you, you're still not going to feel better. We look also, we have a special instrument that measures how much oil do you have in your tears. Because again, we have patients who, we check their bibomian glands, they may have robust glands present, but maybe we have somebody who doesn't blink, and there's no oil in the tears. So we need to know, is there any oil in your tears? But we also look at your glands, because I have some patients that show oil, but we have another instrument that we use to depress on the lid, and we look at the actual oil that's coming out when you blink, and some of it looks like toothpaste. It doesn't look like oil anymore. So we can have people who measure an oil layer, but the quality of the oil is so poor it's, it's like your car. If you wanted to, you know, keep your engine lubricated and you put oil in it, you wouldn't put toothpaste in your car to keep it lubricated. It won't run very well. We have another instrument that actually takes a picture of the meibomian glands in the lid so that we can see if there's any destruction or damage to the meibomian glands. And again, as I said, I've seen patients, lots of meibomian glands, nothing coming out of them, right? Or on the other side of the coin, no meibomian glands. Um, it was really interesting. I saw a patient that was referred into us <coughs> from another optometrist who had tried everything with her and nothing was working. And, and he was finally at the end of his rope and wanted to, s to uh, get an opinion from us. So he sent her over. And we did the pictures of the meibomian glands. And she didn't have any. 
None, not even a little stub. And after I talked to her, it turned out she had gone and had <coughs> that eyelid tattooing where somebody had stuck a little needle all the way along the edge of the lid mm -hmm. so she wouldn't have to use uh, eyeliner. Mm -hmm. And it utterly destroyed her meibomian glands, mm -hmm. right? And she is so miserable. I mean, she's, we can still look at treatments, but you don't want to end up like that. We are getting a new instrument measuring tear osmolarity, which is kind of the how salty your tears are. Because when you come in, we also want to make sure you have dry eye. Because sometimes people will have some of these symptoms, the burning, the watering, the discomfort. And you know what? It's something else. And we don't want to kind of run off in the wrong direction and treat the wrong things. So an osmolarity instrument is actually very effective at helping us determine whether we have a dry eye case or something else right from the get-go. It also helps us determine which is the best tier to give the, the artificial tier to give the patient because it can vary depending on the salt content of your tears. We have another instrument that measures, okay, are you a blinker? I thought I was a blinker. All right, so we got this new instrument. It measures, you know, whether you close your eyes completely. I sat down, had my own eyes done, and I knew what it was doing, right? It's measuring my blink rate, so I'm careful to make sure I'm blinking. Well, I looked at the results afterwards. I'm not blinking, right? My lids were coming about three quarters down and right back up again. And anyway, it was a real <laughs> eye opener. <laughs> um, okay, I got to laugh. That's <laughs> good. Also, we have some patients who, when they go to sleep at night, you think your eyes are closed, but quite a few of you, your eyes are cracked open all night. And that's why in the morning, or even during the night, you can wake up in the middle of the night and got the sandpapery eyes, or you're trying to peel your eyes open to in the mornings. Uh, and sometimes what's happening is your tears are evaporating all night long, mm -hmm. and you're, you're just starting out with dry eye first thing in the morning. This is a lot of stuff, right? So we're also looking at a condition called blepharitis. There's two types of blepharitis. One is caused by bacteria. The other one is a dermatological condition, which is called seborrheic blepharitis. It's like a little, it's kind of like getting dandruff on your eyelids. The other one is caused by a high level of bacteria in the area, which release toxins into the eyes, which also irritate, cause inflammation, can damage the glands as well. And some people get infestation, well, I'll show you a picture of him later, with a, a little parasite called Demodex, which uh, we've learned a whole lot more about in the last few years. Uh, we used to think that was just regular blepharitis, but it's actually uh, a little pest that can live inside the eyelid follicles as well and cause a lot of havoc <coughs> and also damage glands. Mm -hmm. We talked a little bit about, uh, we take a full history so we can find out about medications, what type of environment are you exposed to, and your general health, because certain health conditions like diabetes can dramatically affect your ability to produce tears. And the bottom one I added, actually just today, is a binocular assessment because we've had some patients come in. Like I said, all the complaints sound the same. That's why we're getting that osmolarity instrument. And we do all this testing. We think they have dry eyes. We treat it. And they don't feel any better. They still got this weird fatigue. And then what's turned out, I was reading in some of the more recent journals, is some of these people actually don't have dry eye. They have a, a, a one of their eyes is straight, and the other one's a little bit crooked compared to the other eye. And when they're constantly fighting to keep these eyes together, or using a computer or reading, they get some many of the same symptoms. So we check for that as well to make sure we're not going down the wrong garden path here. So when we look at treatments other than lipoflow, here's just an example of a few of them, blink exercises. So you wouldn't think you'd be exercising your eyelids, but you do. They're actually very easy to do. So I'm going to explain them to you because you can all try them. Um, you close your eyes for two seconds, count to two, you open them, very simple. And then you close them again, you s don't squeeze hard, just a little bit, so you can feel your lids together, and then you open them. So that's easy, but now you've got to do it 30, 40 times a day. So <laughs> that's the hard part. And so what I try to get people to do is, you know, every time you get an email, every time you stop at a stop sign or a red light, if you watch TV, every time there's an ad, try to do your blink exercises. Now, if you have completely blocked meibomian glands and you do the exercises, it's not going to help you. But if you have blocked meibomian glands and we've bothered to unblock them and get you producing oil again, if you don't blink, you've thrown your money away because they'll just clog right back up again. So these are really important, and we're really happy to have an instrument that measures this. 
so that we can check. When we give people the exercises, it usually becomes um, something that you just do automatically after a while. You don't have to constantly do the exercises. And once it becomes second nature, the patient just blinks fully. And we monitor that with um, this instrument we have in our office. Lid debridement. Um, I don't know if you can see it. There's a little instrument up there. Looks like a tiny little golf club. And we use it to just do a, a gentle scraping of the lid margin right where the orifices of the meibomian glands are. And we clean it off because some people have just a mountain of old epithelial cells, debris, dead bacterial cells, and we scrape that all off so that the meibomian glands get a chance to have stuff come out of them. Um, for people who have aqueous deficiencies, the watery deficiencies, we use a couple of products very frequently. One on the left there is called Restasis. You might have heard of Restasis. Actually, very good product. Uh, for people who don't produce enough water from the lacrimal glands, that's because they're producing a special type of inflammatory cell that's attacking those glands. And Restasis works to bring the level of that inflammatory cell down. However, it takes about three or four months to take effect but it can really, it can help. But you have to be real patient with restasis. It's not immediate. Lodamax is a steroid. It's a very safe steroid to use. Uh, we use this often in combination with restasis to, to get people jump-started with restasis so they'll feel better right away. Unfortunately, as a steroid, it'd be wonderful if we could use steroids all the time for dry eyes, but we can't because if you use it long enough, there's some evidence that pressures can rise in the eye. It can lead to cataract formation. However, it can be really helpful for those patients who get those flare-ups. So we get people under control, they're doing well, then they have a flare-up, and then we might put them on Lodamax for a couple weeks. We use a variety of artificial tears, some of them non-preserved, some have oil in them, some are better for the people with the high salt contents and the low salt contents. So we determine the right type of drop to use in your eyes from uh, our study. Ocular ointments are also very handy. The bottom one, Ocunox, I use that myself. I also have dry eyes, better now with the treatments. Um, but again, with that sandpapery feeling in the middle of the night, it's really nice to put an ointment in your eye before you go to bed at night, and that helps create like a barrier over the tears so that your tears don't evaporate as easily while you're sleeping. We also uh, use nutritional supplements. So people have probably heard of omega-3 fish oils. And omega-3, again, can help with tear production, help stabilize the tears. But it, again, takes about three months for an omega-3 fish oil to take effect. There's a new one out now on the very right. You can't see it. It says EPA Plus by Ascenta, the people that make Nutri-C. And EPA Plus is a combination of fish oil and something called GLA, gamma linoleic acid. And GLA is actually an omega-6. So a lot of people think, oh, that's bad. You shouldn't have too much omega-6. And you're right. If you just took... GLA, that would not be good. But if you combine it with the fish oil, apparently they work synergistically, and we get patients better even faster when we put them on that product. At the bottom, these two products we use in more extreme cases. The one on the left is a moisture goggle. So this is a pair for people that have extreme nighttime dryness or use a sleep apnea machine and have air blowing in their eye all night. And it's a little goggle that well, you wear like a goggle at night, and it traps moisture in the eye. You actually have, it comes with a couple little pads that you dip into water, squeeze them out, you pop them in the goggle, you put them on, and you've got a humidity chamber all night. The other one on the right, again, extreme cases, is, a, is moisture eyewear. So these are glasses you wear during the day. And the glasses have a gasket around them to create a seal. So they're kind of between a goggle and a pair of frames. And these two little things right there fit into the side of the frame. So again, you, you dip them in water, and then you snap them into the side of the frame, so you get this continual cycle of moisture. So who are the type of people we have to use those on? Those are the people that have lost all their glands, right? And you know we, we measure their glands. They don't have glands. We've got to look at something to keep the moisture in. Or we have something called neurotrophic dry eye, kind of a new term. What does that mean? So we have a patient, and I've seen this happen. We, they have dry eye, legitimate. We treat the oil. We treat the tears. We treat the inflammation. I get them looking wonderful. Lots of oil. Tears come back up. I don't see any damage in the cornea anymore. 
And I ask the patient how they're feeling, and they say, terrible. Uh, they're not feeling any better. And that's because if you're in pain long enough, your corneal nerves, which are sensitive to begin with, will start growing little dendrites. So it's like a little tree starting to form at the end of each nerve ending. So instead of having one nerve ending, you have 10 per nerve now. So normally, our corneas are sensitive to getting poked in the eye or even a little wisp of cotton in your eye. But now you have corneas that are sensitive to air or temperature, right? So we have people who are in pain because a little bit of air blew by their eye or it got a little colder. So the only way to treat somebody who's grown all these extra nerve endings is with these goggles and moisture chamber eyewear. We have to completely protect the eye so that it's so calm and quiet that those little extra nerve endings will begin to disappear and go away. And, but it takes months for that to go away. So we really, it's very unfortunate when people, you know, get to such end stage um, points in their dry eye. We're really, really, really trying to, fi to find dry eye early in and out and treat it before people get into real trouble with it. So we talked a little bit about Demodex. There he is. Ugly. So that's an electron microscope picture. He's very tiny. He's so tiny that when I look at the, at your lids, you know, with my microscope that magnifies about 20 times, I can't see it. But what I see is his feces <laughs> that are left behind, the excrement. We can see it, little <laughs> sleeves on each eyelash, and that's how we know you have it. See up there on the right? Yeah. <laughs> that, those little, like, little clear sleeves around each eyelash, that's Demodex. And people are pretty miserable with Demodex. Is and Demodex yes. Well, ex very good question. Thank you for asking. She asked if Demodex was common. Uh, in fact, we have about 20,000 of these little critters on our body at any time, and that's normal, okay? So, you know, we're not sterile. The problem is they shouldn't live in your eyelashes. So some people just genetically have a very poor ability to fight them off. And so if a couple are okay, infested with them is not okay. And we do have to get rid of them. And we get rid of them with a couple different ways. I um, put that picture up on the left there of a product called Clearidex, which came out a couple years ago. It's a type of tea tree oil. So Demodex hates tea tree oil. Tea tree oil kills Demodex. But you couldn't put tea tree oil in your eye because it really stings. So some very smart people developed a type of tea tree oil that you can put around the eye and doesn't damage the eye. However, when we have somebody with Demodex with a high population of bacteria around their lids, we have to remove them. And very, re you know, we used to try uh, antibiotics and we tried cleansers. People might have been using like little cleansers and things on their lids. And we keep looking at their lids thinking, why aren't they getting any better? And this is also recent research that shows that those little critters have been building something around them called a biofilm. And a biofilm is like a suit of armor. And they enrobe themselves in this armor. And so when we try to throw antibiotics and things at them, it just kind of, they, they stay hidden and it bounces off of them and then they come out when the antibiotic wears off. So now, we mean war, and we go after them with an instrument called Blefex. The Blefex looks here, like kind of like an electric toothbrush, except on the end of it is a little piece of foam we snap on and it spins around. And what we do is we put a bit of anesthetic on the lids and we go around with this little Blefex instrument and we clean every little bit of the eyelid. We get rid of all the debris, all the excrement, all the buildup of, of cells and epithelial cells and dead bacteria, gone. Uh, you probably can't see it from the back, but we kind of go from a debris-filled lid to clean as a whistle afterwards. So once we have a nice clean eyelid, then we can get at the remaining organisms with products like Clearidex. Uh, Tobridex is an ointment that's got an antibiotic and a steroid in it. Again, if I have a really inflamed lid, I got to get the inflammation down before we can even think about a lip of flow because you cannot put heat on inflammation. You'll make a patient worse. Uh, and then we have maintenance as well, the Theralid cleanser there on the right, which is, uh, we have other types of cleansers too. They're like a foaming cleanser that we use. Again, once we have everything clean, it's maintenance. So, you know, a lot of this treatment is kind of similar to dentistry when you think about it. You go to the dentist, they do the cleaning and everything. They get your teeth nice and smooth and feeling good. And then you have, you have stuff to do when you go home. You've got to brush your teeth. You've got to floss. 
Otherwise, you'll get gum disease. So dry eye is a bit similar to that. You have your treatment. And it could be lip flow, blefax, whatever it is. We get everything under control, but you do have maintenance to do to make sure that you keep your lids and your eyes healthy. I was uh, at a lecture the other day about dry eye, and it was very interesting. He said, 100 years ago, if we had an audience like this here, and the speaker asked the audience, okay, how many of you brush your teeth? Three people would put their hands up out of 100, <laughs> right? <laughs> what happened to their teeth? <laughs> Fell out, right? Gum disease. Today, most of us expect, uh, I expect, to keep, keep my teeth, right? That I'm not, I really don't want to end up with false teeth. And you know what? Our expectation's pretty good about that, that if you go to the dentist, you get your work done, you do your brushing and your flossing, you will keep your teeth. But lid hygiene and lid care is kind of like where dentistry was 100 years ago. You know, maybe this audience will be a little different because you're all coming in for a dry eye lecture, but if I asked 100 people off the street, how many of you are, are cleaning and, you know, looking after your eyelids, maybe three people would put their hand up, right? And as our population's aging and we're using computers and other uh, devices like that, we're seeing more and more dry eyes. So we're thinking of eye care a bit more like the dentist these days. This one here used to be very common a number of years ago, punctal plugs, uh, and they would put, there's a little drainage area, sorry about the people sitting back there, right at the edge of the eyelid there, and there's a plug sitting right there. So there's just like a little drainage channel right in the eyelid there, and we used to put these plugs in to try to keep more tear in the eye, and again, we would have patients years ago who would get worse. Why? Because many of these patients had inflammatory cells in their tears. So if we put the plug in, we just concentrated all that inflammation in their eyes, and they would get worse. So today, we leave punctal plugs to the end. So if I have somebody who I've gotten rid of all the inflammation, I've got a nice oil layer, I've, and I still don't have enough of the watery layer, and we've done everything else, then we'll put the plug in to try to raise the amount of water in the tears. But it's no longer a first line of treatment. So let's go back to the lipoflow treatment because when people get a lipoflow treatment, I've had it done, put the applicators in, they warm up, they massage, it's kind of like spa therapy. And we take the applicators out and all this oil now is in your tears. It's wonderful. I can only describe it as feeling luscious. It's just my eyes never hadn't felt this moist in years. However, we just took every little bit of oil out of your glands. So it feels good right now, <laughs> but 24 hours, not so good because we're waiting for your glands to regenerate. That doesn't happen overnight. It takes about, you know, the, the company says one to three months, and yes, one to three months for some oil to start coming out, but for enough oil to start coming out, <coughs> I have some patients, and myself included, that took about five or six months before I noticed the difference. And it just depends on how old you are, how long you've had dry eyes, there seem to be a lot of factors. Some people are amazing. The oil comes out almost right away. They're telling us, that's why we do a three-month follow-up after Lipiflow, that they're wonderful. And other people are still <coughs> saying, you know, it still doesn't feel so good. And I check them, and yeah, they're still not producing enough oil. Called the company and talked to the um, person that trained us, and the, the very knowledgeable optometrist there, and he told us, be patient. Some patients take longer. Also, you have to be good about the maintenance that comes with it, which I'll talk about. Because <coughs> when they first did Lipiflow, okay, they did the FDA study, and they wanted to know, patients got dry eyes, Lipiflow. They didn't do anything else, just Lipiflow. And they wanted to know, how long did it last? On average, about 18 months. And remember, Lipiflow at that time was 3,500 US. It's a lot of money. And they felt that that's a lot for somebody to play every year and a half to keep their glands functioning. So they started looking into how, what could we do to get this experience to last longer? So they discovered two things. And so I do these every night, and we get our patients to do it. So you see in the middle here, there are a regular Q-tip and a Q-tip with a little point on it. That's a precision Q-tip. We give you those, and you put a little bit of mineral oil on them, and we just do a little swipe right <coughs> on the orifices of the meibomian glands. We just want to keep them... You know, we did that debridement with the blade. We want to keep them nice and clean, open. And then we do hot packs with this guy. 
which is called a brooder mask. So in so remember I was saying bad things about hot packs before, but now that we've got your the glands having oil in them instead of sludge in them, now you can put a hot pack on. It doesn't have to be super hot. You don't have to put it on for that long. And we just want to maintain that oil state now. So now a hot pack comes in handy. And this brooder mask is really cool, um, very good invention, because we want to get moist heat on your eye. Okay, you, sometimes you can buy these um, hot packs that are it's got these blue beads in them. I don't know if any of you have seen that. You throw them in the microwave and you put them on. Well, that's dry heat. So for instance, if you think about an oven, you turn the oven on to 250, open the door, and you stick your hand in. Don't touch anything. You stick your hand in. It's just going to feel nice and warm. You won't burn yourself. But if I took water and I increased the temperature of the water to 250 degrees and I asked you to plunge your hand in there, you're going to feel that. <laughs> you probably have some pretty bad burns. So moist heat is much more penetrating. And how these masks work, they have little beads in them, and the beads absorb moisture from the air and hoard it inside the bead. And then when you put the mask, it's a cloth mask, in the microwave for 20, 30 seconds, it heats up, and the moisture from the beads gets released. So when you put it on, you get nice moist heat from it. So 5 to 10 minutes is enough with this mask versus the 20 minutes we would have to use with a regular hot pack very effective. And somebody actually improved them and put in these little silver ions in them now, which make them antibacterial. So we don't have to worry about people getting all sorts of bacteria in these masks, and they're, they're washable. In fact, they work better every time you wash them. So I'm going to show you a little video. Where is it here? Let me see here. Technical difficulties. Let's go back to... There you go. So you can see the applicators on the eye there. And there's the LipaFlow instrument. And it measures and gives us all this data while it's doing the uh, massage. And you can see it massaging now. See that little up and down? All right. And you can see, see it pumping? And it's pumping again, back up, pumping. Look how glossy her eyes are and shiny from all the oil. So she's saying how her eyes felt sandpapery before, and now she can, they feel lubricated. She can move her eyes. And so that's it. So now you're all experts on dry eye, at least brought you up to date with what's new in uh, dry eye treatment. And uh, I say we're right on time, and I'm very happy to answer any questions. Usually there's lots of questions. Yeah? Is this one of those ones that you can put on your face or on your hand and it will burn? That's one of the most common questions, and I'll I'm going to repeat all the questions for the video. Um, she was asking whether these treatments work for Sjogren's Syndrome. And when I put the information on Facebook and people about this lecture tonight, and people wrote me back, about five people wrote back about Sjogren's Syndrome. For those of you who don't know what Sjogren's is, uh, Sjogren's syndrome is an autoimmune disease, kind of like arthritis, except your body attacks the lacrimal glands. So remember, those are the water-producing glands. So you're probably wondering, can LipaFlow help this? Because initially we all thought, well, why would it help somebody who's losing aqueous? And, and it does, because here's what happens with Sjogren's. So we have a patient who's starting to lose aqueous gradually over time. So the tear layer is getting smaller and skinnier and thinner. Mm -hmm. So the, what the body does to try to compensate, it tries to produce more oil. So it ramps up the meibomian glands and gets them producing <coughs> more oil. So try to hold in that little bit of tear that's still there and keep it from evaporating. But what happens is eventually it starts to burn out the meibomian glands. So we now have a patient who has just a little bit of tear left, the aqueous, and they're losing their oil layer as well. And when that happens, they become very symptomatic because they don't have anything keeping the tears in. So we have treated people with Sjogren's syndrome. They need more than LipaFlow, I'll tell you right now. It's not like a simple thing. However, 
we, I have had patients who were really suffering. I had one young, and she was just a young lady. She was only in her 20s. And she had strands that were adhering to her eye. She was so bad. And gradually, with all the treatments we did, she can now blink. And she has some tears. She has some oil in her tears now. We were able to save her meibomian glands. But with Sjogren's syndrome patients, you know, there, there's a lot of therapy. There's even some newer stuff where we can actually, sounds a bit weird, we can take your blood and they spin it down and take out the, the blood cells and just keep the serum and you mix it with artificial tear and then you actually put your own blood product in your eye. I know, it's, it's like vampires, right? And the reason, I, it's very effective actually for Sjogren's syndrome because the serum from your blood is almost identical to your tears. So it's a really wonderful tear substitute because it's exactly like your own tears. Another uh, product that's come out, which is used in more extreme cases, these are the people with graft versus <coughs> host disease. These are people who've had a um, transplant and they're, um, they develop an autoimmune disease where it's like, it's like a Sjogren's on steroids where they, they have rampant destruction of the lacrimal glands. And so they've actually created a contact lens that's made out of amniotic membrane called, called Procara. And that can be inserted in the eye in, again, very extreme cases. And the products, I guess, from the placenta are extremely healing to the eye. And again, we can get those patients, they can't, don't work forever, but they get them under control so that the regular therapies can start to work. So short answer, yes, it can help. However, it's not the therapy for Sjogren's. Sjogren's requires lots of therapy, right? And, and you never get rid of it. We're just trying to manage it. Mm -hmm. Oh, sorry. Another great question. See, that's a great question. So here's the question. Uh, what about people who have had cataract surgery? <laughs> this has been very interesting because uh, we send people for cataract surgery all the time in our office. We don't do the surgery. We send to a cataract surgeon. Cataract surgeon does the surgery. And I had a patient come in, I think it was a number of months ago, and she was complaining that, you know, my eyes were fine before the cataract surgery. I can see well now, but my eyes are so dry. And they go back and they tell the surgeon, you know, my eyes are killing me after, what did you do to me after my cataract surgery? And the surgeon will say, it had nothing to do with it. Your, your cataract surgery has absolutely nothing to do with dry eye. That's wrong. They've proven there's a, there's a big connection between cataract surgery and dry eye, very similar to the people that have had laser surgery, right? So the people that have had laser surgery, they make a big cut in the cornea, create a flap, do the laser, and those patients get dry eye too, contact lens wearers. And what happens is when they sever the corneal, some of the corneal nerves, and some of them are more important than others, so they, they make their incision in the cornea when they do the cataract surgery, and they sever some of the corneal nerves. Mm -hmm. And then they have to grow back afterwards. So while, and some people, they don't grow back properly. Either they form too many, and you get this extra innervation, or they don't form enough. And what happens is your eye doesn't know when it's dry anymore because it can't feel it. Right, like for instance, when we have people have laser surgery, they have the cut done, they can peel onions afterwards, don't produce any tears, because they don't feel anything. So it kind of numbs your eye at first, and it, it reduces tear production afterwards. So some people are actually advocating, if you have a patient who's borderline dry eye, before cataract surgery, make sure you treat the dry eye first, get them under control, then go in for your cataract surgery especially if anybody's considering some of the newer multifocal implants or implants that correct astigmatism, you have to have a really good tear layer afterwards. And yeah, so there's been a lot more, uh, there's a doctor in Quebec who does a lot of these treatments, and he says that I think about 25% of his dry eye practice now are people about to head in for cataract surgery that are getting their dry eye treated first beforehand. <laughs> what was that? Because as far as they're concerned, it has no effect. Yeah. Well, the yeah. thing is, the dry eye happens after the cataract surgery. So yeah. the issues all come up after the cataract right. surgery. Right. The question was, issues come up after the cataract yeah. surgery. Well, that's that's and that's, that's because we have, we have a borderline dry eye patient. Remember, five glands only need to be functioning. Yeah. And then you have the cataract surgery, and it pushes you over the edge. 
just like somebody who's comfortable, and then they go to Arizona, and they're not so comfortable anymore. But if they go to Florida, that's okay, right? <laughs> not with everybody. <laughs> oh, sorry. The question is that people who don't remove their mm -hmm. eye makeup, can they develop some of these problems with the eyelashes? Yes. You can certainly start clogging up your meibomian glands, so it's a really good idea to clean that makeup off really well. And we do have some actually good uh, professional type cleansers in the office that do a better job of that. And makeup, uh, old makeup too, is a great breeding ground for bacteria. Mm -hmm. So what happens is bacteria will move in as well and start eating the makeup and then they'll release all of their toxins into the eye, which can start damaging glands, which can increase inflammation, which damages more glands, which increases inflammation, and then the patient just starts to spiral down. So yes, cleaning lids is a really good idea, like that Blefax treatment. Mm -hmm. How many of you had your eyelids cleaned? Right, never, but we would even think of going a day without brushing our teeth, yeah. right? It's like really unhygienic to let, especially people, women who wear makeup, yeah. to let that keep piling up. Yeah, question here. I mean, uh, just a quick question. I think in Germany, oh, yeah. when I went to the office, uh, I had like clear eyes. All right, the question was, if your eyes water quite a bit, is that a good sign? Only with onions. Just with onions. Mm -hmm. <laughs> All right, well, it means that you have some aqueous production, which is good, so your eyes water. But I, I have patients who will ask me, and I'm going to go into another question because a lot of people ask about this one, which is why – you're telling me I have dry eyes, but my eyes water all the time. <laughs> right, everybody's, yeah, how can that be? Why am I having dry eyes? Okay, let's go back to the chapped lips. Dry lips, what do you do? You keep licking them, right? So dry eyes, if you have functioning lacrimal glands, they're going to keep trying to produce more water to make you feel better. But if you don't have any oil in your tears, doesn't matter. Your tears are just going to evaporate, mm -hmm. and it still feels terrible. terrible. However, if we have a patient who tells me, you know, my eyes don't normally water, I feel pretty good, but if I go out and there's co it's cold outside and windy, they water, or sometimes in bright sunshine they water, that's probably not dry eye. So we don't, I don't usually do lip of flows for those patients. If they have oil in their tears and they're looking pretty good, that wateriness is just somebody, you're getting a little older, you're getting a little bit more sensitive to those sort of conditions, but it's not treatable with with a lipid flow. But if they're watering all the time and burning and stinging, then that's usually dry eye, even though it sounds kind of crazy. Right. Yeah? What is the lipid flow for the lipid flow? The lipid flow is $1,200. Right. And um, I wish the question is, is it covered by Blue Cross? And Cindy, I don't think anybody <laughs> yet is covering lipid flow. And maybe eventually they will. It's kind of like when they first came out with laser surgery to correct people's eyesight. Nobody covered that at first, but now they do, right? Uh, their most insurance plans have some coverage for that. So I think it's just, I mean, we're the first ones in the Maritimes to have it. Pe more people have to start complaining to their insurance companies that they should have coverage for this because it's a disease that we're treating right. with an FDA-approved instrument. What about the other thing that you mentioned the insurance plan? Uh, the what, well... Let me go over some of the fees here. So when we have, the, the question was whether any of the auxiliary treatments are covered. So when we have a patient come in for dry eye assessment, that takes us a whole hour, so we charge $150 for that. And as far as I know, most insurance plans will not cover that. Any of these fees that aren't covered by insurance, you can write off on your taxes as a, as a health expense. And let's say you do need a lip of flow. That's $1,200, and we have payment plans available as well. Um, and you come in for follow-up visits after that. Those are generally covered by MSI, right, because now we're just getting into the treatments afterwards. But the actual dry, like when we see you for the dry eye treatment, I do bill MSI for seeing you, but we charge you the 150 for all the instruments that we're using to take all the measurements. Same thing with Lipiflow, right? We need to charge for the Lipiflow because they charge us for those activators every time we use them. They're only used once, and we have to throw them out. But we do bill MSI, for your visits. So if you all you need is blink exercises, and I've had some patients come in, that was it, that's free. Um, and their follow-up visits are covered. And if they needed a drug or medication, we prescribe it. If it's covered under your drug plan, it's covered. 
most over-the-counter products like the artificial tears are not covered. Sometimes PharmaCare will cover some of them. Sometimes if I write a prescription, it'll be covered. So take another question here. Oh, sorry, the, the lady behind you just, yeah. I'll take her first, I'll take you sec. <laughs> okay. Yes? Another great question. Okay, the question was, and I, that reminds me about restate. That's what I forgot <laughs> was restasis. All right, so as you know, a lot of people are treated with restasis for dry eye. And the question was, if I get a lipoflow procedure, would I still need to use restasis? Maybe is the answer. And I'll just explain a bit more about restasis. So restasis, as Memory said, works by helping to improve lacrimal gland function. More recent studies are showing it can actually improve my bomian gland function as well both. So I've had all things happen. I've had patients on restasis get a lip of flow and if the primary, the doctor was kind of wrong about the reason for your, your dry eye and it was a real meibomian gland issue and the prime reason was because you didn't have oil in your tears, then yes, I've had people have a lip of flow done, we restore the oil, they're no longer using restasis. But if you're one of these mixed cases that some of it's meibomian gland, some of it's aqueous, then we may still have to keep people on restasis. Sometimes people can go to once a day on restasis rather than twice a day. Um, it does kind of depend, uh, but restasis can be effective, as I said, also for my Bomian gland disorder as well. So we do use it quite a bit. But what I like to do in treatment is, I if I have a patient, let's say that has both, not enough oil, not enough water, I always, always, always treat the oil first. I want to get that oil back because I could treat the water layer, and if they still don't have oil, they're not gonna feel any better, it won't do anything. But I've had some patients where I've treated the oil, I got that normal again, and once the oil layer is restored, the tears fill up underneath it, and they're fine. So I'd rather keep the number of treatments to a minimum, if I can. So we usually, in the direction of treatment, oil first, tears later, unless my devices are telling me and all the measurements we're taking show a perfectly normal oil layer and no tears, no aqueous. That's different. Right. And the gentleman there. because you're just filled up with tears. The question was, that's the difficult one to treat. The, the, that was the only one that, that sometimes we have difficult. This is the person who goes out in the cold air and their eyes just start to water. And you know, I've been to a lot of lectures, done a lot of reading, and they're still struggling with that one. That, and, but you know, one thing we check for as well, which I didn't mention in the lecture, is something called conjunctival chalasis. And we, we do check for it when we look in the mic with the microscope, but some people have a little bit of excess of the, th there's like a little transparent skin over the white part of your eye. And in some people, it starts to become redundant. It gets folds of it. And tear, and when you <coughs> blink, you don't completely get to cover your eye. And so tears kind of flood up over this area and just run down. And so some people actually need that surgically corrected if that's present. And it just can be exacerbated by cold air outside. So, and a lot of doctors, if you don't look for it, you don't see it, right? So that's another thing that we look for as well. But right now, that's the one time I'll tell a patient that you might just have to live with that. Because uh, I think we tried a lip of flow on a couple people, and even though, yeah, it helped with their, their tear, their oil layer and everything, it didn't help with that. They still watered when they were outside in the cold. That's a good question. The question is, do you need a referral to come to see us for a dry eye assessment? The answer is no. You can come from anywhere, and because we do a complete evaluation, right? So, no, no, you don't need a referral. You can come directly to our office from any province. Yeah, 
and questions in the back. question is, should I stop my regimen before I come in for an assessment? The answer is, if you can, <laughs> yes. I think it was 24 hours before, Cindy, that uh, we like people to kind of go, if they can. Uh, we get the occasional patient that just can't. But if you can, we want you to go off the drops about 24 hours before the appointment so we can look at the true nature of the oil layer, the tear layer, uh, without having any um, artificial tear or oil in there that might disrupt the measurements. Question here? You are 80? Oh my gosh, you look so much younger. <laughs> yes. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Dry eye is a very new area. Um, I actually finished a lecture series. Um, they were a uh, very uh, renowned speaker on dry eyes was doing a lecture series online. And it went for five months. And he lectured once a month for an hour. And he even told us that two years ago, only two years ago, they brought together the top dry eye people in the world. And they had a special conference to discuss dry eye. They've completely thrown out what they said two years later. So it's really, really new. We had it wrong. And Dr. Korb, who invented the lipid flow, he was right on the money. He's an older guy. He's in his 60s. And he was saying for years, it's a problem with the meibomian glands. And he was right. And so now the other doctors have come online and agreed with him. They have evidence now. We have instruments that can measure this. We didn't have any of this before. I feel really bad for patients who've come in, and I'm looking at their meibomian glands thinking, you should have had treatment five years ago, but we didn't have this five years ago. We didn't know about it five years ago. So a lot of doctors, like I put on lectures at my office for the local optometrists because they have never heard of this, right? So unless you really want to become very involved in dry eye and keep up to date, it may not have filtered its way up through yet, through the ranks. What right. happens with, <coughs> what happens with uh, is that just a whole new ranks audience? And also, are the local audience at least as trained? The I feel I'm not taking the question. You're not. The question is, why didn't we deal with this 15 years ago? Good question. Um, because sometimes people that develop new ideas are not believed for a very long time. In fact, uh, we've started a specialty in our office treating brain injury patients, and the, the guy that uh, we had him lectured, in le just been doing so many lectures, he was just here Saturday lecturing, and he mentioned that you know he's been treating patients with brain injury for 30 years, and it's only been in the last five that people have been listening to him, right? So sometimes the people that are on the forefront it's like the guy that developed the, the vaccine for, um, I forget whether it's polio or smallpox. He was, I think it was 10 years later before they actually started using it because he was laughed out of the room, right? That, you know, so it's un very unfortunate, you're right. And I try to keep really up to date. And just the research hadn't been done, people uh, just didn't know. And we have much better instruments now to detect dry eye and treat it. And when this Dr. Corb developed the first instrument, it was crazy expensive. That's why there was only one in North America in Toronto when it first came out. And people came up from the States to have it done. And yeah, but I wish it had been available years ago. Right? But it's like anything. Why isn't there a cure for cancer? Yeah. Right? We're working on it. <laughs> Yes, <laughs> yes, blink, blink, blink. Sorry, there was a question here? How many doctors in your office have assessed uh, assessments? Assessments? Four of us right now. We are uh, adding two doctors this summer, and we'll be training them. We're getting them to be trained and doing LipaFlow as well. So by the fall, we should have all six of us able to do it. Right now, we're currently at four doctors. Yeah. Right. Yeah, so what we do is each one of us usually does a dry eye assessment day a month, right? And so we, right now with the four of us doing it once a week, there's usually a dry eye clinic running. And so if we have six of us doing it, there'll be six days throughout the month where we'll run a dry eye clinic. It's, it's much easier for us to 
have all the patients coming in with the same thing, and then because we have this uh, testing sequence where they have to run through the lip view instrument first and get all these tests done, and we see them. So it's a smoother day if I've got my, my brain wrapped around dry eye all day or brain injury all day. And so we run specialty clinics in the office. However, if we do have a patient who can't come in on one of those days we're running a dry eye clinic, we do make exceptions and try to get them in on another day. You can offer me some assistance? Yes. 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 Okay. Yes. Yes, just like those goggles I was showing you. They go right around. Yes. I should have mentioned that. That was another reason we used those moisture goggles. They were developed, actually, for motorcycle drivers initially. No, they, they're made in prescription. Right. Yes, and they're they're instead of glasses. No, that's a good idea. Right, because sometimes people wear safety glasses and they can still get particles and things coming. Whoops, sorry, John. Uh, certain things coming in from the side, and so these have a gas, and the gasket can be taken out and put back in again. So you can wear them like regular glasses, or you can pop the gasket in on a dry eye day, and get the moisture in. So there's. There's a few different companies that make them. One of them is a dry eye company, but the other is a motorcycle company that has developed these. Any other questions? Yes? All right, the question was, are floaters a sign of age or dry eye? Uh, age. <laughs> yeah, they have nothing to do with dry eye. I, I can explain to you afterwards what, what floaters are. That's a good question. Any other questions from the back? Okay. Question is, uh, how long does it take to come in for an assessment, get treatment, et cetera? Uh, yeah, I should have explained that. The right now, um, I would say you could get in, except maybe af not after this lecture, <laughs> but normally uh, within about a month or two at the outside to come in for an assessment. The treatment can be done that day if you're a candidate and you decide to have it done that day. Or if not, we can always bring you in another day to do it. It's not that hard because the doctor doesn't do the treatment. We have a, um, a dry eye hygienist who actually puts the activators in and does the treatment. You're semi-reclined, right? And we have mood, we have like spa music playing and pillow under your head and <laughs> aromatherapy. It's, it's very pleasant to have it done. But I do want to tell people that dry eye is not a simple thing to treat. Uh, in my experience, especially when we have more severe cases, you know, we treat them, and I have some patients, it takes me nine months before I get them better. So you have to be a bit patient with the treatment because it took years to get yourself at this point, and it's like an onion. We're peeling back layers, and many of these treatments take three to five months to take effect. So we have to keep waiting for the three to five months to go by and then add another treatment. So it's, it can be a little painstaking. Yeah, sure. Don't be sorry. Question was, is there a connection between severe dry eye and light sensitivity? Absolutely. Uh, yeah, because when your eyes are that irritated and inflamed, then any, um, if you have inflammatory mediators in the eye, they're also stimulating the iris as well. And so your iris can, when we have somebody has a, a bad inflammation of the actual iris, when their pupils constrict or dilate, it's extremely painful for them, especially constriction. So they'll, you will see them coming in with dark sunglasses on as well because they can't stand light. So same thing in this case we have, it's not as bad, but we do have an, a case of inflammation in the eye. So yes, the, the eyes are already inflamed, so any movement of the iris becomes more painful for the patient, absolutely. Good question. Yes, I would take this question here. Oops. Partly, yes. So the question was, if you have dry eyes that's worse in the morning, part of it can be because of that crack open, and some people have so many inflammatory chemicals in their eyes that when they have their eyes closed overnight, they accumulate. 
right? And then in the morning, they feel much worse, right? So we have to figure it out. Yeah, we don't guess when we do the dry eye assessment. We figure out what's wrong and treat it. Commonly, um, I mean, almost everybody with blepharitis has MGD, but not everybody with MGD has blepharitis. So MGD can be kind of silent. We can look at lids, they look perfect. But if I use my little instrument to see if anything comes out of those glands, nothing is coming out of them. But the glands still look fine. But people who have blepharitis and they have loaded with demodex and bacteria and flaking everywhere, oftentimes that's because of all the chemicals and the, the, the toxins being released and the inflammation starting, that will start to clog up the meibomian glands. So that's a good question. The question was whether dry eyes, can they affect your vision uh, by the end of the day especially? And as I mentioned before, your tears are the very first media that light has to go through to enter your eyes. So it's like the dirty windshield. If you have a dirty windshield, you can't see. You try blinking to clear it. It may work for a second or two, just like getting the wipers to go back and forth. But unless you get some, you spray your, your windshield with some cleanser and there's something to wipe, it just stays blurry all the time. So well, I think it's really interesting that you're talking about the inner eyes that the red lights are coming and it's open. Yes. And then it's coming straight and it's open. Sometimes it's both lights, sometimes it's one light or the other. Yeah, it's not a fun disease. But it's still there, it's coming, but it doesn't it doesn't always get your vision. Yes. And we it's also have to look we also have to look at other factors. So the question was, you know, the the, the pain can move from one eye to the other, sometimes you can't open one eye, sometimes the other eye. And it's, it's a multifactorial disease. Sometimes the patient has allergies on top of everything else, like the itchiness that you mentioned. Yeah, so sometimes itchiness yeah. is from dry eye. Sometimes, but maybe it's not a regular allergy. Maybe you're allergic to the bacteria that have accumulated on your lids. You know, so we, again, we kind of have to tease it all apart. And I don't like throwing every treatment available at a patient from day one. Okay, probably it would work <laughs> if I did everything, but that's just too much for people. So we, we, we figure out what's the worst thing that's happening to your eyes right now. Let's deal with that first, get that under control, and then the next step and the next step. So it's kind of a step-by-step -step procedure that we work through. But it's a miserable disease. Yeah. Yeah, so I mean, and like I said, we have people that, let's say you have dry eyes, right? So your tear production has gone down. So now you don't have enough tears to wash out allergens. So you may not have normally have allergies, but if you have enough of an allergen in your eye, it's going to make your eye itchy. Mm -hmm. So let's say a cat hair. I could put a cat hair on my skin. I don't break out. If I stuck a cat hair in my eye, which I have, I have two cats, it's so itchy, right? It drives you insane with the itchiness. So you may develop an allergy because you don't have enough tears to flush things out of your eyes yeah. anymore. So I think there was a question. No? Oh, okay. Any other questions? I yeah? have one really kind of interesting thing to ask next month. Okay. Yep. Should I? Well, I don't know because I have dogs and so I'm not oh sure. Oh, no, you've probably seen Dr. McLeod. I'm not yeah. so sure of the who. So uh, should let me I? just should let I me thank that? everybody. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I'd just like to thank everybody for coming. It was very, I mean, we had just a great showing. I'm always happy to answer questions. So I think our phone number, email addresses, everything on the on those folders there. I'm, I call myself and explain a maniac with my patients. I love to ex teach and I love to explain things. And I think it's really important for people to understand uh, problems that they have. So I'm always happy to answer any questions that you have. And thank you so much for coming tonight. Yes.